So in 2014, my friend uh, Joe Robbins went to Schumacher College. Do you know, I'm just aware of something. Polly used to tell me to not say um. <laughs> but I also noticed she always used to say I. You do the Scottish I. And like, I was like, you do that I thing, Polly. She's like, oh, it doesn't count. <laughs> but, okay. Um, <laughs> so I might I. I might not. I might I'll probably um. It's a bit Yorkshire. So, yeah, Joe went to meet uh, with... Charles Eisenstein and Polly and just came back absolutely buzzing and full of life and thoughts about how we do change. And then Polly and Ian moved to Stroud and I very nervously felt that I needed to meet this amazing woman and felt very shy and wondered if it would actually happen and how to make it happen. And, you know, I just went to Star Anise and there she was. <laughs> As if by magic. <laughs> It was very natural, and I said hello, and that I wanted to start Mass Civil Disobedience, a great way to start a conversation. <laughs> and she, you know what, she was perfect. Because I can tell you, actually, as a working-class woman, my dad was a coal miner, I've told so many people since 2010 that I believe what's absolutely necessary is Mass Civil Disobedience. And I've been met, if I'm honest, by much discouragement and, and, and being dismissed and, and, and not really being heard. And it's OK, you know, I'm, it's fine, because I'm a Torian. <laughs> and I just pick myself up and carry on. And Polly was absolutely instrumental in giving me what I needed, which was two things. Well, three things, actually. Friendship. And, but in particular, really deep encouragement. She absolutely believed in me instantly. She said, that's an amazing idea. And she encouraged everybody she met. She had written a book called Dare to be Great, and she just believed in everybody's potential to, to lead and to do what these times require of us. And the second thing she did was that she introduced me to a, a person who was heading up a, a chambers, a barrister, you can maybe guess who, uh, but uh, respect some privacy. And that person corrected the error of a, a solicitor who'd given me some legal advice, who'd said that I was risking conspiracy charges and that conspiracy charges had maximum life imprisonment. So I was basically crapping myself, constantly trying to organise massive disobedience and thinking I was about to get sent down forever. So I used to run off and put letters in the post to people. And um, <laughs> this person told me, sure, but conspiring to do what? Change the world. And actually, you know, you probably get six months re re reduced to three. So suddenly... <laughs> Suddenly, I felt absolutely liberated to uh, really push in a much more open way for what I was trying to do. So there's been a journey. I helped set up Compassionate Revolution with Barity and Dinesh and others who are here. And one of the first things that Dinesh uh, and I did together was to uh, start... I, sorry, start a mass meditation for ecocide law. So we talked about Compassionate Revolution as being... Uh, mass acts of art, heart and civil disobedience. So that was a heart piece. And then Compassionate Revolution, after I met Roger Hallam, became uh, called Rising Up. And we, as part of that, did some anti-fracking protests. So a lot of this journey is what you do on the outer and also what you did do on the inner. And in this room, you know, I, I needed to move forwards in my life. And it was like I had one foot on the bank and another in a boat and was struggling to make that move. There was a, a, an important moment happened in this room when Polly and um, a woman who dances in change worked together and we did a piece of alchemy in this room, which was a key part of my journey. Polly said that sometimes to make a law, you have to break a law. And I think sometimes you have to break a window even as part of that. And, <laughs> Simon, uh, who's my boyfriend and also a co-founder of Extinction Rebellion, which was a campaign that started from rising up, but obviously it's got its own feet now, was especially focused on bringing campaigns together, the campaigns that we were doing in Rising Up and the campaign around ecocide, bringing it together on a legal footing. And he worked with uh, Polly and her team on the Earth Protectors, on the Conscientious Protector Defence, 
So that's been a key part of what we've done in Rising Up. So January last year, with support from Polly, we created a dossier of harm caused by fracking. Uh, three of us from, four of us from Stroud had put ourselves in arm tubes in, in Preston New Road in front of the fracking site as part of a role in resistance. And myself, Poeng, who are, and Josiette, who's here today, were in court last January, and we were one of the first people to run the co conscientious protector's defence. We were found guilty, and we didn't expect anything otherwise, but we all learned through the process uh, things like it's probably helpful to self-represent. Some barristers are a little bit timid. And... Um, <laughs> Do you know, there's, there's, there's some, I'll come on to that. There's something here about when you really don't give a shit anymore. Um, I mean, in a good way, when your heart and your will are like that. And so the next defence that's been thought of that aligns with conscientious protectors, and I know Polly's done a piece of work on this, are crimes against humanity, looking at that as a defence. And after January, we were welcomed back by Polly's team and supported uh, with our crowdfunder. We had our fines paid off after 48 hours, which was a relief to not have that financial burden. <laughs> so it's about £1,000 between the three of us. So Extinction Rebellion was discussed last year and agreed in my house in Stroud uh, in April. And we launched it on October the 31st. Greta Thunberg from the Swedish school striker came to support our launch and we did a period of rebellion in November. There were actions at Downing Street, at DEFRA, at the Department for Business, Energy, Industrial Strategy, which was anti-fracking. And there were many arrests, uh, including myself and Simon, but they seem to have, we, and we would be running the defences, but they've actually keep dropping the cases. So we've had over a thousand people arrested this, t this period of rebellion, uh, which is phenomenal. And so we're waiting for some of us not to have cases dropped. <laughs> <laughs> and that's probably going to be the Shell action. So all honour to the people here that took part in the action of Shell. It was very much done in honour of Polly and her work. And for anybody who has any doubt, Polly was very much behind the smashing of the window. <laughs> I know that can feel like an act of violence. But in all honesty, when something is done with love and care and with responsibility, and when you stay and, you t and you're willing to take the punishment, that is not an act of violence, that's an act of deep love. And it's also very tactical, because by doing more than £6,000 worth of damage, that case, when it gets heard, should be heard in a Crown Court with a jury service. Uh, with the jury uh, present, which is much more... I'm, I'm feeling like I, uh, there's a, probably a lawyer here could correct me on any of this information here, but um, the, the point being that we're always we're pushing an edge, and what I'm obviously trying to say to you today is that the Extinction Rebellion and Polly's work are very intimately linked spiritually, emotionally, in friendship, in love, in solidarity, and also very practically. Polly was, um, is, in my view, a, what you'd call a bodhisattva, a great soul, who'd come to this uh, place to do some work with us all. And I had the deep honour of sitting in a full-on ceremony with her one time, which involved vomiting and all sorts. <laughs> it was really full-on. And... Um, so, as well as being that raging soul, I've also seen her as this really fucking hard Scottish lass <laughs> who could knock back her medicine like a whiskey. I mean, if she needed to do something, she was a warrior as well. So I just wanted to honour her warrior spirit. I've all seen Jojo for so long as her right-hand woman. And also, you know... Polly has a phenomenal team we all need to get behind, but I particularly want to speak about Jojo. They were so and are so aligned that Jojo and Polly would make decisions on behalf of each other. They would do their sort of internal muscle testing, connecting to a deep intuition and the connection between each other. And I'm absolutely sure, 100%, that that peace will remain. And in that way, Jojo will not only have a, her own wisdom, but will be carrying Polly's wisdom with her. 
Um, Jojo and I have done work together at the, around the incinerator, and that's something we all need to take on, right? I mean, we're not letting that thing fire up, are we? Um, <laughs> has been a thing trying to encourage civil disobedience. I did say recently in an interview, it's been when you talk to people about it and you talk to them about the possibility that they might break the law, it's like you've just asked them to sort of strip off and have a poo in the corner or something. <laughs> That's what it was like a few months ago, but not now. I mean, people are just like, yeah, I'm in, I'm in. Uh, and again, no pressure on anybody. Everybody has a different role in this piece. But um, Jojo and I... Uh, have done some cheeky things at the incinerator, right? And uh, I just so admire your ability to get shit done. I want, we, we sort of talked about this occupation and I get a little bit, uh, project manager heads, it's all, oh, just suddenly it's happening. It's just happening. Incredible <laughs> energy and a phenomenal mind. And so I'm asking us all, and I really actually feel this, I'm speaking on behalf of Polly here, to get behind her team and in particular, to get behind Jojo's leadership now, to lift her up in our love and in our support. Yeah. So over to Jojo.